Hello, puppies and kittens. Welcome to uh, a, uh, another hangout. This time I'm do interviewing another author, and this is one that I know. This is Dr. Josh Bowen, uh, and and we we affectionately know uh, know him and his wife as a team called Digital Hammurabi. And uh, Dr. Josh is uh, is is working on uh, soon to publish a book called The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. And uh, I, I read that book and I, I, I found it very amusing, of course, that, that I like the way that you went chapter by chapter on different points um, and that I, I was I was. I, I got exactly what I expected to find that, that you what you're telling me that the Bible wasn't written by Moses. What? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> so so l tell us a little bit about your background for people who don't already uh, intimately know you. Uh, you know, we know that you got a PhD from Johns Hopkins in Assyriology. So fill us in on what all that means. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, my PhD was was basically um, on the heels of a whole bunch of uh, formal training at seminary. Uh, I got a master's in theology in Old Testament studies, the Hebrew Bible. So I was really big into Semitic languages. I was reading Hebrew and Aramaic and Ugaritic and Syriac. And so blah, are you blah, Christian blah. then? I was at the time. Yeah, definitely. A uh, fundamentalist, evangelical Christian. And uh, I remember, I've told this story a bunch, but I remember I was teaching Hebrew at seminary uh, my last year. I just put, finished my thesis and I was, I'd been accepted to Johns Hopkins to go into the Assyriology program, which is basically just studying the ancient Near East, uh, particularly Mesopotamia, uh, but sort of encompassing all of that area, but like Akkadian, Sumerian, all that old stuff. And uh, I remember uh, I walked out and the dean said to me, uh, are you are you ready to go in, you know, to, to this very liberal school? And I held up my Hebrew Bible and I said, I'm going into the lion's den, but I'm going to save souls for Jesus, you know. And uh, yeah, about a semester in at Hopkins and I was an atheist. So, <laughs> you, you know, know just, to, just to put us just to put us both on the same footing. I remember once upon a time when I was uh, when when I was doing my neo pagan occult spiritualism, there were these things that I could do and I could show other people to do that that to me would demonstrate the truth mm -hmm. of the spiritual world, and and so I I became this warrior that I want to go out and show people the truth of this, and then I realized what truth really means is what you can actually demonstrate, you know, and and not just, you don't just have to believe it, yeah. <laughs> right. And when I put my own stuff to the test, uh, pretty quickly, I, I, I went the same way. Uh, yeah. we were, where Dillahunty uh, had tried to to, uh, to disprove his roommate and ended up disproving himself, right. I did much the same thing, and it sounds yeah. like you did too. Yeah, kicking and screaming in my case. <laughs> kicking and screaming. I was like, this can't be true. This you know, somebody came to me uh, a few days ago to, to tell this joke about, you know, so you, you, uh, you're an atheist. You're going to talk to me about the Bible. Tell me more and more about the book you haven't read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of people chimed in immediately to say that you're saying that atheists haven't read the Bible. Why do you think yeah. that they're atheists? <laughs> It is definitely my experience, particularly since, you know, coming onto social media like two or three years ago, uh, that more often than not, if I have, if I see an atheist in a room and I see a, a Bible believing Christian in the room, the atheist knows the Bible far better. Um, so that's my experience in this. And that brings us up to the topic of, of what you're writing about, because I had a handful of questions. And if I, if I say these things on my own, I have no expertise. I don't, I, I don't know Assyrian. I can't read Akkadian cuneiform or Sumerian cune, uh, cuneiform or any of that. I'm just told how ignorant I am. So uh, I'm, now that I have you know, a scholar with some expertise on this, I'd like to ask a handful of these questions. And one of them being, and this is just my own personal thought, uh, you know, we uh, what they call it, the Tetragrammaton, I think, is the mm -hmm. name, the you know, Y H W H, right? And mm -hmm. so people, people have a tendency to to, to uh, pronounce that Yahweh, but it occurs to me that it's not that way, that it's it's just missing vowels, mm -hmm. and it struck me that it's Yeah Ho Wa Yeah Ho Wa, because one of the the, the things is that I read is that you, you chant uh, God's name.
what would you say to that? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so part of the problem, of course, is that uh, because the Masoretes, the people that, you know, during the uh, that long tradition of uh, transmitting the Hebrew Bible in the um, uh, starting after um, it's, it's sort of coming together, uh, they are the ones that we sort of rely on for the vowels, right? So they put the vowel pointing in and it's not always the case. Um, you know, we can, we can get it at obviously different ways, but that's a substantial part is that they're the ones that put the vowels in. And one of the things that they did is they, they didn't want to pronounce that that was God's name. They didn't want to pronounce it out loud. And so one of the ways that they would do that, that they would provide for that in the, in the writing is they would have the the consonants those the y h v h o d v a f a um they you know that that would be in the text but what they would do is they would take the vowels off of it and they would put the vowels around it and the way hebrew is you have the consonants but then the vowels kind of go above and usually above and below it and what they did is they put the vowels above and below it for another word and the other word was adonai which means like my Lord, my Lord's. Um, and so when a reader would read this, they'd come up to that word, they'd see the consonants for the word Yahweh, and they'd see the vowels for the word Adonai, and they'd go, what is this? And then they'd, oh, okay. They, they want me to pronounce the word Adonai, my Lord, instead of pronouncing God's name. Well, uh, later, and I want to say it was in the 17th century, I can't remember, uh, people came up to the, these, these manuscripts um, and saw yod heh vav -Heh with a o a as the vowels. And they went ya ho va And then putting the, the consonants for Yahweh and the vowels for Adonai together, and they formed this word Jehovah, which, again, is, is just putting together Yahweh and Adonai. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was probably pronounced, and then this, this is debated, obviously, it was probably pronounced in antiquity as like Yahweh or Yahweh, or, I mean, probably Yahweh with a W, but um, certainly there's a tradition has formed that Yehovah, Yehovah, that's, you know, that's how, that's where that comes from. Um, so well, I suspect right. that probably has, yeah, I mean, it, it probably has some, uh, there's probably some validity to that, 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 uh, that people have used it that way, you know, like uh, originally, you know, it's tough. Yahweh's difficult because, um, because we don't know exactly the vowels that should go with it. Um, again, I think most scholars would say, most Hebrew Bible scholars would say back, you know, in, um, the iron age that this was pronounced Yahweh. Um, because but, what, I'm uh, hearing, what I'm hearing is that, that is that my, my, assumption or hypothesis is correct that that uh yahovah is it is the link to jehovah the tetragrammaton is the link to jehovah but that it didn't start out with that name right and we're not entirely sure it started out with yahweh either is that right yeah it's it's tough to know um there are some things that factor in you know and of course this is a very complicated linguistic uh argument that I, this is certainly not my area of expertise well, um, let me let me close this up with a with a, another little story. I, I remember reading uh, a Jewish legend that the first woman, not Eve, but Lilith, mm -hmm. was made equal to Adam, uh, and then uh, Adam wanted to be superior. He wanted to be on top, and I'm like, I'm just really surprised that this is a this is a religious legend, right? So um, he wants to be on top. And she wants an equal position, or she wants to be on top to ride cowgirl, I guess, or whatever. And then, and so she's not happy with that relationship being dominated. But she was able to escape the Garden of Eden because she knew God's true name. Mm. And knowing his true name gave her the power to fly. And so she flew, and she, the legend then goes on, to, that she had a wild orgy with demons on the shores of the Red Sea. There you and go. That, yeah, and that once Lilith was gone, then God had to construct Eve, and he made Eve out of Adam's rib, and so she's the new girl, and so Lilith stole back into the garden disguised as a serpent, mm. and that Lilith was the one who tempted Eve, 
and that because Lilith is a female in the guise of a serpent, that's why all of the Renaissance paintings, the 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 the, the entrance of Notre Dame Cathedral, the, the 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 ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, all of those render the serpent of the garden as a woman. Hmm. The tradition of casting that character as Satan hadn't yet begun, or hadn't gotten popular at least. Hmm. That's so very I interesting. A, <laughs> I have another question for you. Sure. And this, this is going to be again completely off topic, but. <laughs> Is the is the Ugarit since we were talking about pronunciations, is the Ugarit's god name pronounced Baal, Baal, or or what was the other one? Baal, Baal, or Baal, Baal. Baal, yeah. Baal. So it's Ba all. Two syllables. The emphasis is uh it's on the penultimate syllable, it's on the, the first syllable. So Baal, Baal. I thought I had seen Jewish words with the two A's and like Aaron, like Aaron, for example. But it's the first one is A and the second one is A, so you Aaron, and so mm. you know, so the, the B double A was supposed to be Baal. Yeah, I mean it. The pronunciations of, of foreign words in English, like uh, you know, the way that people pronounce it today is usually Baal. It's usually what I hear, which I mean is absolutely fine. Uh, but yeah, the, the way that you would read that in, in Hebrew, at least, would be Baal. Baal. It's called a segalit. Um, well, if we keep discussing these pronunciations, we're going to conjure somebody. So I'm going to move on. There you go. We don't want to say. <laughs> just don't say it three times. That's all. <laughs> okay. So now I had a. I did have some other questions there. Um, you mentioned in your book. You gave a couple of references that uh, that there's the claim that the Bible supports child sacrifice, human sacrifice of children. And I've long said that it that it does, and I think it pretty clearly does in a couple of places. You give references to to read a couple of books about that. Uh, since you mentioned those, but did nothing else about them, can you briefly tell me why you refer people to these other two books? To talk about what is it that we would find there if we did read them? Yeah, so I mean, to to, to sort of cast this um, in broadly, um, the Hebrew Bible goes to great lengths later on. Um, particularly later on, to say child sacrifice is foreign and awful and terrible, right? Francesca Stavrakopoulou has written about this. Um, and uh, an, another good friend of mine, um, Heath Durrell, out at um, at Princeton's written about this. And it, it essentially, the, the question that they're trying to get at, particularly Heath, is trying to get at is, is this Apologists, when you talk to apologists, the first thing that you hear, if you ever bring up something about genocide, you talk about the Amalekites in 1 Samuel 15, or you talk about Numbers 31, or you talk about the flood, or any of these things, or the Canaanites, the first thing that, that I hear coming out of their mouths is, man, do you know how horrible those people were? Yeah, that's like, what I was going to say. They're, they're, they're sacrificing babies, and they talk about the bronze altar, you know, of Molech, you know, and the children is, ugh. And, right. Well, these are <laughs> like the, the, we have to be very careful when we talk about the ancient world um, that we don't just go with propaganda, right? And and that's true not just of the Hebrew Bible; that's true of anything. You know, if you go read through uh, Neo Assyrian or Middle Assyrian royal inscriptions, you know these ins inscriptions of of kings that are talking about the war or the the battles that they've fought and the people that they've conquered. You know, th these are kings that are going out and kicking ass, you know, particularly to the West. And uh, they're stealing a bunch of, you know, a bunch of tribute and a bunch of goods and stuff from people. Uh, and, you know, that can't look good. You know, if you're writing about that, that doesn't look good. Well, so what do you do? You say, well, we got how do we make it so that we're justified in, in conquering these people? I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make them evil. Right. So if you read through some of the Middle Assyrian royal inscriptions, they'll talk about their God's name was Asher. Right. And uh, so it was Syria, Asher. And they'll say the rebellious lands were, were sinning against Asher. And even though Asher was extending to them his benevolent arm 
and, you know, wanting to help them and to bring them. They rebelled against him and sinned against him. And so I, the, the just king, had to go and fight against them. And you go, yeah, probably not. Right. And we all recognize that. We all recognize that <clears throat> bullshit. You know, right. Like, <laughs> it's, not re- it's not really what's going on here. Mm-hmm. The, the problem is that when people come to the Hebrew Bible today in particular, because it's, you know, it's it's an important religious text, they go, oh, my God, the Canaanites it's, it says the Canaanites were terrible. And that's why they had to kill them and wipe them out and drive them out of the land from their homes. That's because they were really bad. Uh, you right. Mean, you mentioned Numbers 31. So w- when Moses sent his people into into Median, yeah. And what they did to the Medianites. So they just, they raid the city. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's everything that the Vikings are supposed to be doing. And you, you, you charge in there, you tear everything up, you, you kill everybody, you burn everything down, steal everything. And so you've got all these brigands that, that charge into people's houses, kill mama, kill grandpa, kill, till, kill dad, kill grandma. And then the, the women and the children are taken as, as well as the, the donkeys and the sheep and all that. Mm-hmm. And then Moses gets angry that his people were being merciful to the women and the children. So he orders that all the little boys had to be slaughtered in front of their mothers and that their mothers then had to be butchered in front of their daughters and that all of the daughters, had, if they had not known a man by lying with him, if they were virgins, then they could be kept alive for yourselves. The virgins you can keep alive for yourselves. Yep. I don't know exactly what for yourselves means. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you do. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so they're being very specific about keeping little girls alive for sex. And I'm trying to just imagine how, how traumatized are these kids in, in this situation. And this is this is the guy who's speaking for, for, for God now, right? So you mentioned the median women and you called them women. And I was curious about this because um, the way I saw them described in, in every uh, translation I've seen is that they're called women children. Mm-hmm. And I, I just assumed that they must be preteen girls, according to the tradition of the Talmud being less than 12 years old. And they're like, well, let me look. there's a couple of translations I could check here. Uh, let me see. The one passage attempts to paint the females among the little ones. Uh, let's see, the American Standard Version refers to the daughters as girls. The new, reverse, new Revised Standard calls them young girls. King James Version calls them women, children. And Young's Literal Translation calls them infants. Mm-hmm. And it's clear in any case that we're talking about keeping children alive for yeah. the purposes of sex. And if they've been used, then they have to be murdered. And I, it, it, it's, it's hard for me to imagine any of the Bible being God's word when putting children into sex slavery is the good guy. Yeah. And the people arguing for why Moses did this evil thing was that the Median, Medianites were such bad people. Yeah. The fuck did the Medianites do <laughs> to, to, to deserve this? How do you cast them as being the evil? Well, oh, they worship the wrong God. Looks like you worship the wrong God. <laughs> Right. I mean, I think this is this is really the this is one of the key problems that I have with apologetics. And I'm not I'm not so you know, I, I don't I don't have such a problem with people if they want to be what I would consider to be like normal, humane, uh I don't know, Christians. Like my wife is a Christian, right? She's Anglican. And like she, she, she looks at these stories in the Old Testament and like is disgusted by them as much as anybody is. Uh, anybody that's not, you know, a, a, an evangelical or, you know, like a fundamentalist style Christian. And the problem that I have with this, of course, is that instead of coming to this text and going, whoa, you know, let, let me let me rethink how I've uh, how I've understood this. It's well, how do I defend it? Right, and this this is what's problematic. Uh, so we see outside of this passage, 
uh, like you can read through sort of the marching orders for the Israelites in Deuteronomy 20 and 21. When they go to war, here's what they're supposed to do. And if you read through Deuteronomy 21, I'm sure you know this passage well. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if among the captives, if you see a beautiful woman that you'd like to have as a wife, you can take her. Um, and here, here's the procedure for that, right? Here's the procedure for taking her as a legal wife, you know? Uh, but, but the point is I was talking to, uh, there's a scholar by the name of Jay Caballero, um, who's getting ready to graduate from university of Texas, Austin. He's studying, um, ancient Near Eastern law, uh, and he, in the Hebrew Bible. And he's studying under a guy named Bruce Wells, who's a brilliant ancient Near Eastern legal specialist. And I, I, you know, I was talking to him about this passage, and of course, he's what he's writing on um, is uh, essentially sexual crimes in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, in the ancient Near East. And he said, "Let's not be fooled here. Like this is rape. This is straight up rape that it's condoning, right? There's a this 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 captive woman has like she's not consenting." She's not saying, oh, this is a great idea. I'd love, you've just butchered my family. I would love <laughs> to come marry you. That's that's awesome. Um, you know, so th this is what's problematic about this. And uh, this book that, that's coming out is volume one. Uh, volume two is going to have an entire chapter dedicated to genocide in the Hebrew Bible and all the apologetic arguments that you see Um you know, to sort of whitewash it and uh, and what it, what it really talks about. So, I've spoken about that a bit myself. Where you know, yeah. if they say a woman comes home and she finds that her husband has now loaded a new teenager into their bed, and she's a prisoner of war, but now she belongs to him, and you and you you now have to take care of what is potentially your replacement in that marriage. And there's nothing you can do about it. So it's, it's just unfair to everybody. And that's not even getting into numbers five. Where mm. the whole, <laughs> yeah. When a guy goes off on a trip, which usually takes months, you know, for to go anywhere takes months. And he comes back and mysteriously his girl is pregnant and he puts the math together in his head. It uses his abacus and realizes that, hey, this doesn't add up. And so he can then take take his wife to the priest who's then going to force her to drink some cursed potion. It's a, it's a potion that is literally cursed. It's made out of like goat shit and dust, but it, it's basically a potion that is, that is cursed. God has to participate in this. And then if it causes her to miscarry, it causes her womb to discharge mm -hmm. and leaves her barren. Well, that means that she cheated. But yeah. if it doesn't kill, if the potion doesn't kill the fetus, that means that, that, that it's his and that she hadn't cheated on him. And Christians argue to death that that's not an abortion. Well, if she's pregnant as she takes this potion and it leaves her barren, what is that? Well, it doesn't say she was pregnant. No, you're right. It doesn't explicitly say that she's pregnant. But what if she is? Well, it doesn't say that. Yeah, but what it's, would be the reason why he thinks she cheated? I mean, it definitely says that there's a discharge of semen in her encounter with the other guy, right? With this hypothetical other guy, there's a, you know, it's, it's like a, it's like a lying of semen, but it's the same, it's the same, you know, phrase that's used to talk about when a man ejaculates. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's certainly not a stretch. It's certainly not a stretch to say that if this were actually practiced, which like, I don't think, I don't think anybody actually thinks this was practiced, right? I think this is part yeah. of this. Sort of this utopian. seems to be something that would be that would be laid out like if 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 you suspect them that this is what's going to happen. But I also got the impression that nobody ever actually did that. Yeah, there's there's definitely a practice that was done in the ancient Near East called the river ordeal um, in Mesopotamia, and they would it's it's the same sort of principle where it's it's a situation where you you suspect something but you don't have evidence. You don't have a witness. You don't have you know. To, you just don't have evidence of it. And so what you do is you, you have to call upon the gods to help you because they see everything uh, or they know everything. And so but they won't uh, show up and give testimony. They, they <laughs> Right. Yes. So, so the, the, the river was a God, right? And so what you do is you go to the certain part of the river, the Euphrates river, and you throw them in and depending, there's different things that could happen, but like the God is the one judging them. 
Um, and this is the same sort of thing that's going on in Numbers 5. And yeah, it's true that the text, I don't think the point of the text is, all right, here's the law on abortion, right? I don't think that's what's going on. Um, however, in the same way, I don't think that Deuteronomy 21 is saying um, it's okay to rape people. I don't think that's what the text is intending, but it's certainly what the result is. Yeah. Right. That's certainly what the result is in the same way that, um, you know, in Exodus 21, where it talks about uh, if two men are fighting and they strike a pregnant woman, that passage clearly shows that the fetus is not considered from a monetary standpoint, from a legal standpoint, a human. Right. It's not considered on equal footing with uh, a, a, like the woman. Right. Um, and while that's not the point of the text, the point of the text doesn't give, you know, to give some sort of treatise on uh, the value of humans or whatever. Yeah. Uh, certainly that's that's one thing that you can you can determine from it. So I think that's important to recognize. So we mentioned we, we started on this tangent talking about uh, whether the Bible uh, endorses the sacrifice of children. And what I wanted to mention to you is that one of the things that Christians have constantly com uh, criticized me for is that I'm completely misreading the Bible when I read Exodus 34, where Moses goes back up the mountain because he's destroyed the Ten Commandments, which was not actually ten. It was never ten commandments. He brought down a whole buttload of commandments. I didn't bother to count them because I'm not sure. In Exodus 20, it seems like there's either 11 or 14 commandments just there, depending on how you read it. And so, and, and that list continues in Exodus 20, uh, uh, 21, 22, 23, until he comes back down the hill with, with all of these things, right? And, and all of these, these races, commandments, and all the, the, the things that we, you know, where you can't charge uh, interest on loans to other Jews, and Jews have special privileges when you have to be released from slavery where other people don't, all of that kind of crap. But then when you get into Exodus 34, which is supposed to be God re rewriting the Ten Commandments, except this time it is only ten. And he says it'll be exactly like they were before, except that there's nothing, except that the first two are, are, are the only two that are still the same. And they're not even the same. They're paraphrased over what they were before. Even those two are not original. The, suddenly the fourth commandment is no longer honor thy father and the mother, which I think is the original fourth commandment. Now the fourth commandment is that you have to sacrifice your children. Do not hold back offerings from your granaries or your vats. You must give me the firstborn of your sons. And then every Christian wants to tell me, well, that didn't really mean what it says. Don't you love those arguments when, when you say the Bible says this and people says, no, it do doesn't say that. You show them, well, that, that's not what it means. That's not what it means. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what it says becomes that's not what it means. Well, OK, what does it mean then? And they say, well, they didn't really do that. And then I turn to a number of other places. There are other places in the Bible that says, yeah, they actually did do that. Uh, I, I got some on screen right now, uh, uh, Leviticus 27, 28, and 29. But nothing that a person owns or devotes to the Lord, whether a human being or an animal or, or a family land, may be sold or redeemed. Everything so devoted is most holy to, to the Lord. No person devoted to destruction may be ransomed. They are to be put to death. Now, is God's word literal? Is it God's word? Is it the absolute truth? Did people actually do this? Numbers 3.13, for all the firstborn are mine. When I struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether human or animal. They are to be mine. I am the Lord. Ezekiel 20 to 25, uh, 20 and uh, goes to verses 25, 26. So I gave them other statutes that were not good and laws through which they could not live. I defiled them through their gifts of the sacrifice of every firstborn so that I might fill them with horror so that they would know that I am the Lord. That's telling me people did that. Ezekiel is lamenting that people really did sacrifice their children to their God. Yeah. And this is this is sort of what, um, if you read through Heath Durrell's book, and we talk about it, you know, a little bit in, uh, in my book, um, there's a difference between what the Hebrew Bible, particularly later, is is reacting against. He makes the statement in the book. Uh, <laughs> he says, you know, you don't tend to make laws against things that people aren't doing, right? And so, you know, when when, when Ezekiel's lamenting that they're doing this, it's not because they're not 
doing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's because they are. And so what he's trying to get at, and we have to be, this is one of the things that I think apologists aren't careful about. Um, and that is having a, a foot in each interpretive camp. Let me explain what I mean for a second. If you say Moses wrote Genesis, let's say he wrote all of Genesis. If you say that, and then you take somebody to Genesis 37 and you say, how did Jacob or how did Joseph get down to Egypt? Did the Ishmaelites take him or did the Midianites take him? If they say, well, wait a minute, you know, one is P and one is J, okay, one is this, th th this, this tradition, this source, and this is this other source or tradition, you would say, well, well wait a minute. <laughs> you just said that it was Moses that wrote it. Yeah, 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 it is and Moses that wrote it. For the benefit, it the benefit of the audience, when you say this is P, this is J, you're talking about the priestly versus, uh, what is it, the Yahwist? The Yahwist. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and so they can't have it both ways, right? You can't say Moses wrote it, and then when you point out a contradiction that shows this, this couldn't be by one person, you can't then appeal to the two different <laughs> sources that refer, you show two different writers. You, you, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You got to pick one. And, and the same is true, I think, in, um, in talking about things like child sacrifice or genocide. So I had a debate recently, Matt Dillahunty and I debated um, Stuart and Cliff Kneckley. And in that discussion, you know, they, they on the one hand, they talked about how awful the Canaanites were and how awful this child sacrifice and all this terrible stuff. And then in another part of the debate, they said, oh, well, you know, like most scholars agree that, and then they cited something that was like critical, something that would go away from like a fundamentalist uh, inspired position, and you go. Wait a minute! You 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 can't have this both ways. You have to you have to argue from one or argue from the other. Uh, never tw do the twain meet or whatever. You know, um, never the twain shall meet. And so, uh, here with child sacrifice, you can't you can't say. Uh, well, we know historically that there was child sacrifice. Um, but look, the Hebrew Bible says that the Israelites aren't supposed to do it, so they weren't doing it. And, and it's, it's, you can't do both. So what, what Heath Durrell is talking about, particularly in his book, is he's giving the evidence that we have from the first millennium, BCE, for child sacrifice, and there's not a lot, right? There's not a lot that we have actual archeological, you know, or textual evidence. We don't have a lot outside of the Hebrew Bible. Um, however, we're, it seems reasonable to conclude that the Canaanites were sacrificing children. And it's also very reasonable to conclude that so were the Israelites, right? And they're offering these sacrifices. And a lot of times Christians will say, okay, I can get down with that, right? They're offering sacrifices to like Baal or Baal. You know, no, 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 no. They're offering them to Yahweh, right? That's the point. They're offering them to Yahweh. This is what the biblical writers are reacting to. That this early, you know, this earlier tradition or this thing that's brought in by Manasseh or Ahaz, um, that these are things that are being reacted to. And so I, I think it's just it's important to recognize that there's there's some propaganda going on, a lot of propaganda going on in the Hebrew Bible. And you can't just open it up and go, all right, I'm going to lay out my history by reading these pages because it's that's not how this works. Uh, you have to be able to recognize uh, that that these Israelites, the Israelites were doing many of the things that they're strongly reacting to in the text. And for that reason, um, because they, they were doing them. One more thing that you had in your book that I, that I thought was amusing, which isn't probably relevant to the rest of it. It just it just uh, I just found it charming when you 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 said you found some old you found a letter. And I, I'm guessing this was uh, like a, a, a bit of dried mud with cuneiform on it. You know, maybe maybe that's what you're talking about. But you, it's, a, it's a letter from a wife berating her husband. Uh, when you left, you didn't leave me one shekel of silver. You cleaned out the house and you took everything with you. Since you left, a terrible famine has hit the city of, of Asher. 
that you did not leave me one liter of barley and I need to keep yep. buying barley for our food. Now we live in an empty house and the seasons are changing. Make sure you send me the value of my textiles and silver so that I can at least buy 10 measures of barley. And I'm just, yep. I'm just this is a wife berating you. And I'm shaking the, the, the husband if he was in there in the room at this at that moment. It's like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> 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 well, it was it was a it was an interesting time. It's actually Megan, my wife. She's also an Assyriologist. It's her favorite period of time. It's called the Old Assyrian period, and it's right at the beginning of the second millennium BCE. So you know, like nineteen hundred BCE, and you've got this this thriving um, trade network that's been. If you if you think about like Iraq right now, you know you you think about like the northern part of Iraq and, you know, north, uh, eastern Syria, they're traveling from that area and they're going up into Turkey. And what they're doing is they're bringing two things. They're bringing tin and they're bringing these textiles and they're, they're traveling by donkey caravan up into Turkey and they're trading them there for like, I, I, I can't remember, but I think it's at least double the price that what they cost back in, you know, back in the East. Um, and this just developed such a business that they actually set up like a, they called it a port uh, out in Turkey. And people people would set up these, all the, these complete enterprises. And they'd have these donkey caravans that would go up with the tin and the textiles and they'd give them to their, you know, their, their uh, fellow business partners there who were living in that, in that area. And they'd set up shops and they would sell all the stuff for them and, you know, keep, keep certain percentages, but people, because it was a long trip and you couldn't travel all year long because of the weather, um, you know, they, they would, they would stay up there and sometimes they would stay for a year, two years, three years. And so they would, we have accounts of this, like we have letters in cuneiform, uh, from these archives that show the same kind of interaction you were just talking about, uh, wives writing to their husbands, complaining about them because they've, They've got two families now. They got a family out in Turkey, and they got a family back in Asher, and uh, and and this this was just the way that it was. And um, so we get to see that sort of it's the, sort of behind the scenes. There's no there's no real propaganda. There's no, it's not a royal inscription. You know, it's not something to the gods. It's just letters that people are writing, complaining having about the this same, shit. having the same kind yep. of arguments we still have now. <laughs> that, is, that is exactly right. That's what makes it so fascinating. So, uh, the last thing I want to ask you about is uh, in the last chapter of your book is talking about Tyre, mm -hmm. and one of the things that 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 I wanted to mention about that was that I don't think you you mentioned in your book that Ezekiel didn't just fail on that prophecy. You know, when you go into the next one where he where he where he kind of admits that his prophecy of Tyre failed. Yeah, uh, you know that they, they labored tirelessly. Uh, against Tyre and then retired tirelessly. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> well, when he when he admits that they didn't do that, that they that that, that that prophecy failed, it was in the course of making another prophecy that we also know failed. Yep. And I was just surprised that that your book didn't mention that. And I wanted to thank you because when we when we spoke about this in, in the email, uh, you said you were going to reference me. Yep. And, and I and the part that I shared with you from my book. Well, obviously, I don't. I didn't do the, the the scholarly research that you did. What I did was I went to two different apologetic sources, yep, and I contrasted the explanations that they were both giving and how they contradict each other. Yep. And one group is saying that the, that 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 um, that the tire was the tire was completely abandoned. The other one says no, it wasn't. And one says that it actually did sink under the waves. Yep. The other one says no, there's still people living there. Yeah, you'll get a little how, bit of everything. How can both of these be true? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very complex, Aaron. That's the thing. It's very complex. God. Right. Yeah. Well, I I, it, it, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, you please. It's just, the, the, the fascinating thing about something like Ezekiel 26 to me is that it's only a problem for a certain type of apologist. Well, a certain type of Christian. And those are generally apologists. You know, I have a really good friend out at Tyndale. Um, a guy that I went to Hopkins with, we're, uh, we're best friends going through, connected at the hip. And he's an evangelical Christian, right? Love him to death. He's he's fantastic guy, brilliant, brilliant guy. And uh, I, I saw him at a uh, at a conference 
a couple of years ago and I said, I was putting his video together and writing a paper about it for YouTube, you know, and, uh, and I was sitting there having a cup of coffee with him and I said, Hey, you know, I I'm doing this video about Ezekiel 26. And he said, what about it? And I said, you know, the failed prophecy against Tyre. And he said, why? And I said, Oh yeah, well, because there are apologists that say that it didn't fail. And he went, what? <laughs> this is an evangelical Christian, right? And he's like, oh, what, what, what do you mean? Of, of, of course it failed. The way that he said it, it didn't come true. I mean, there's like, is that a debated thing? I said, apparently, um, but only here, right? And and this is the, this is the, that's the interesting thing to me. So that the fact that I have to go and provide all of the substantial background information and talk about what we know historically, what we don't know historically, uh, what the text actually says, the parallel structures in the liter, you know, in, the, in the, the literary structure of the passage and all this stuff to try to, to show something that like biblical scholars, this isn't really a debated thing. The way that Christians deal with this is they say, okay, well, prophecy functions differently in different places, right? And there are different ways that people think about that, but it's a theological issue. It's not like this historical thing that, oh, well, it must have been talking about, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, but then like, you know, because of the switch in the pronouns, it's also talking about Alexander. No, it's, it's, it's not I've, a problem for them. I've spoken to a number of evangelical Christians who have scientific credentials, you know, usually in genetics. Hmm. And the, the evangelical Christians who are trained in genetics have no problem with, I mean, Adam and Eve is just a fable. Yeah. Noah's art never happened. You know, I don't know what their what their theology is necessarily, but they're just not burdened yeah. with it, the way that that the apologists are, and the apologists have to let's be faith, let's let's be honest, the, the the apologists have to lie when they know that this stuff didn't come true. When Ezekiel admitted that 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 uh, Nebuchadnezzar never took Tyre as he predicted, mm. he then predicted that Nebuchadnezzar would take Egypt. That's right. And leave it a barren wasteland for 40 yep. years where neither where, where no human nor animal foot would trod for 40 years. That was supposed to happen while Nebuchadnezzar was still alive in the age of Pharaoh. That never happened either. Right. Yep. But apologists will try to come up with any kind of excuse necessary. And, and that's that's what really disturbs me about but that's probably the most disturbing thing for me about the whole concept of religion is when it stops yeah. you from being able to admit or admit reality, or or just think past this. Yeah. You know, when you when you ha when you have the blinders on so badly that you've got to find some way to justify how this nonsense was true, even though even when you know it's not. Right. You got to defend it anyway. It's it's interesting. Um, so I've got a chapter in that book on the dating of the Book of Daniel, and in it I quote a scholar by the name of Lester Graeba. And uh, I'll have to paraphrase because I can't remember his quote precisely. Uh, but he, he essentially says, he's talking about fundamentalism. And he says, fundamentalism isn't asking a question because it already knows the answer. There's no way that it can be wrong. He says, if, uh, if, the, if it has biblical evidence, it uses it. Um, if it has uh, contradictory evidence, it twists and distorts it to fit its own narrative. Uh, if it if there is no evidence, um, it hypothesizes that one day evidence will be found. And of course, no amount of evidence to the contrary uh, is sufficient because fundamentalism cannot be wrong because it has to be right. It's I, I, the, the example that I use now or the analogy that I use now is that, that TV show Monk. Um, if you've ever seen that, that detective show. No, I know every, what you're talking about. Every episode starts off with Monk, like there's a murder, and Monk says, that person did it. And everybody looks at him sideways and says, that person couldn't have done it, right? He was in jail, or he was on the moon, or he was wherever. And Monk says, nope, he did it. And the rest of the episode is you knowing that that guy did it because Monk said it. And what you're doing and what they're doing is coming up with some of the seeming the craziest circumstances. Like he sends a projectile back from the moon while he's up there and it clicks a button and that causes, <laughs> and you know what? It turns out to be true, right? Because it's a TV show, but it's based on the premise that, you know, as the, as the audience, Monk is always right. 
And this is apologetics, in my opinion. This is fundamental apologetics because it starts with the premise, the Bible said it, therefore it's right. Which and we have that, to, yeah, go ahead. Which, which reminds me of that painful debate we had with a with an Islamic apologist who was arguing mm -hmm. that when it, when when the Quran says that semen is between the backbone and the ribs, there's got to be some way that, that he can justify how semen is at some point in the thoracic cavity. So he, he, his final explanation, I think, was if you lie on the ground and you look up someone's skirt, then from that perspective, then the... <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> All right, Dr. Josh Bowen, if you'd like me to include any links uh, in this, please, please let me know. And, and it, take, a, take a last minute, if you would, and just, just sell yourself what you're doing, where people can find you and all that. Thank you. And Aaron, I really appreciate you having me on again. It's, it's, it's my been, pleasure. It's always a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, the book is called The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. It should be coming out, uh, hopefully, almost certainly by June 1st. Um, Megan has just finished her final edit, so she's now going through and formatting some stuff. Um, but it'll be available on Amazon like the rest of our books are. We have a Sumerian grammar that she and I wrote that is for the absolute beginner. If you're interested in that sort of thing, I have published my dissertation as a popular book that is about Sumerian prayers. Um, and of course, I have my book on did uh, the Old Testament endorse slavery. If you just go to Amazon and type in Joshua Bowen, B-O-W-E-N, you'll, you'll see all of them. Uh, but our, our work is done at Digital Hammurabi, H-A-M-M-U-R-A-B-I. And um, we're all about making the uh, ancient Near East and the Hebrew Bible accessible to people that aren't specialists in the field. Right now, we, uh, we're running our scholarship program for PhD students, and we're actually in the middle of doing interviews now. Um, so you can go to the, the channel and check out all the latest research that scholars, uh, that students, PhD students from Jerusalem and from Harvard and from Brown and from Berkeley and Yale, they're, they're all coming on and giving interviews for all the stuff that they're doing. Um, but you can find anything from, if you're interested in the dating of the book of Daniel, there's a series on that. If you're interested in old Testament slavery, there's stuff on that. If you want to learn to read Hebrew, I've got a series on that. It's all free. Um, you just go over to our YouTube channel, Digital Hammurabi. So I'm on Twitter, DJ Hammurabi1, I think is my handle. And Megan is Digi underscore Hammurabi. I'll um, include links below. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So um, no, we just, uh, we're here for the atheist community. That's the point of this book, sort of in closing. That's the point of the book. Aaron, I got on social media because of you, uh, because I started watching your debates with, uh, particularly with Kent Hovind, actually. And uh, from there, I started watching you debate um, Christian apologists who were using Hebrew and using Greek to argue against you. And I kept thinking, they don't know Hebrew and Greek. So that's why we got on. And uh, I, I see a lot, as I'm sure that you do, atheists, in my opinion, get bullied online. And they often get bullied because apologists will, you know, somebody will bring up first, first Samuel 15 and say, look, how can you, how can you uh, get behind a God that, that calls for the mass genocide of the Amalekites? And their immediate response is, do you know the context of that passage? And if the atheist doesn't know the context, it's over. Now, they're absolutely right in their assertion. How can you get behind a God that calls for genocide? Because that's what that is. But because they didn't know the context... The debate's over. That's what this book is for. That book is for people to understand the broad context of things like what's the, the story of the Bible? Um, what, what's the history of the ancient Near East? How does archaeology work? Uh, and then it gets into very specific things like the dating of the book of Daniel, slavery in the Hebrew Bible, the book of Ezekiel and that prophecy. Did Moses write the Pentateuch? We deal with all that stuff. So it's for atheists. It's, it really is meant to be a handbook for if you're going to go have conversations and debates with people or discussions around the Thanksgiving table with your Christian relatives. Um, and this is my three-year-old here. He's come in to show me his new backpack. Uh, but that's what the book is for. No, it's absolutely fine. But uh, yeah. Anyway, thank you, Arn, for having me on. Sorry about that little bit of interruption there. But. Thank you. Wait, we all got families. I got, I got, I got parents and dogs that go off all the time. <laughs> It's all good. All right. Thank you, Josh. Happy to have you on again. Thank you, Aaron.